man with the golden voice, Matt Munro. Born free, as free as the wind blows, as free as the grass grows, born free to follow your heart. surrounds you the world still astounds you each time you look at a star Matt Monroe is one of the most distinctive singers to emerge from the British pop scene of the early 60s you're free as a rose. His elegant voice, unmatched by any vocalist sense, is admired throughout the music business. He picked up a song so quickly, he never asked any kind of deep questions about it. You know, like some people get, what is the real meaning of this thing, you know? He just kind of sang it. Along with the Beatles and Bond, he was to become one of the UK's biggest exports. By the time of his early death, at the age of 54, Monroe had sold over 23 million records worldwide. Matt could sell a song. He would act a song. You got shivers when you listened to that. In a career that spanned the most dramatic changes in popular music, Monroe remained true to his working class roots, a singer of populist, middle of the road songs. He smoked like a chimney, drank like a fish. <laughs> he was. He's probably one of the least healthy people I can imagine. But when he sang, he just expanded, and the notes came out and went on forever. It's these songs that have become Monroe's musical legacy. Nostalgic anthems of a bygone age. The soundtrack to the swinging 60s. A golden era when Britain was cool, and Monroe was the singer who gave it its voice. something about the purity of his voice which must be commented on. It is like a camera lens on which there is no dust whatsoever. You listen to it and you wait for the imperfection. You wait for the dust, a speck. It doesn't come. Then the world's all right and everything's swinging. I'll go on singing my song. And yet somehow when it came to singing, he was able to keep it crystal clear. It's a beautiful instrument. I think Matt Monroe's special for all sorts of reasons. The basic one is that he was a great singer. He had a fantastic voice at a time when good, pure voices really counted. For me, embodies a, almost a kind of a, a lost world, really. And we think of the 60s as all long-aired rock groups and guitar smashing and all of that, but at the same time, running concurrent with that, and probably just as big as that for many people, was the singer. Not even the singer-songwriter, but the crooner. On days like these, when skies are... And fields are green I look around And think about What might have been Matt's voice was in a class of its own And then I hear Sweet music Float around my head As I If David Niven could sing He would have sung like Matt Monroe Matt's voice was cultivated and cultured. 
It's on days like these that I remember singing songs and drinking wine while your eyes play games with mine. His diction, it's so classy. So he'd sing an ordinary song, but with that approach and that accent and the whole approach to it, it really elevated it to some exalted arena. With his cool sophistication and trademark black tuxedo, Matt Monroe was the James Bond of easy listening, the essence of urbane 60s glamour. Yet Monroe was not born into this jet set world, nor with a name that was to make him famous. Like so many icons of the 60s, he fought his way up from the streets of working class post-war London. If you were working class and you were vaguely ambitious, you wanted to get out of the working class, as it were, you wanted to enjoy the fruits of, of post-war affluence, well, you could be a footballer, you could be a criminal, or you could go into entertainment. And what's really important about people like Matt Munro is they showed it was possible. You could, in a sense, transcend your class. Matt Munro does represent a certain style of social aspiration or kind of moving up in the world. But it's a style of aspiration whereby you keep your roots. So although you aspire to the good clothes and the house in Surrey and, you know, probably the, the bar of your own with all the optics in it and lots of suits in a, in a wardrobe made by a great tailor, it's still a kind of a working class aspiration. He kept something of the working class guy about him. Look at him and you don't have to close your eyes too tightly to see the craze who come from just up the road from him. I mean, they come from about three quarters of a mile to the east of where he grew up. And he would have moved in the same sort of milieu as them. A world where men looked like men. They were well groomed. They were sharp. The hair was always neatly cut and always properly slicked back. They were smart. He had a very, very hard upbringing. And I think you never forget that. And he was always very careful over money, not tight, but he never forgot where he came from. And I am once again with you. Matt Munro was born Terence Parsons in Shoreditch, London, on the 1st of December, 1930. The youngest of five children, he showed little sign of the musical talent that was to emerge later. Oh, but that was long ago, and now my consolation. His father died when he was very young. His mother had to manage on the pension, which in those days was 10 shillings a week or 50p in our money. She had to go out and she did cleaning, a bit of cleaning and things like that. <coughs> so that, you know, he, uh, he had quite a, a, a poor background, really. But uh, it didn't stop him being a cheerful young lad. He had quite a lot of friends, some of whom perhaps it'd been better if he didn't have, but uh, nonetheless, it kept him cheerful. Leaving school at 14, Monroe seemed destined to a life of mundane jobs, perhaps ending up as a factory worker, like his late father. But encouraged by friends and a few pints, the young Terry Parsons began to take to the stage at his local dance hall. The first time Alice and I both heard him sing, came down to Boston to have a drink, which was shortly before he was going into the army. I think it was the night before he was going into the army. And to our surprise, when we got in the pub, people started saying, sing to us, Terry. Terry, sing us a song. As soon as he got up to go singing, Alice immediately rushed into the ladies' toilet because she felt so embarrassed, you know, because obviously she got no idea what it was like. Dream 
dust gets in your eye. While they were in there, they heard this lovely voice coming through, and they thought, surely that can't be Terry. And they came out, and of course it was, you know, and that was the first time, really, we'd appreciated he got this great talent. Dream dust can make you cry. He came from North London, I come from North London. I'd even discovered later that I'd gone to dances and uh, as a teenager, of which he'd been singing. But I had no idea, because in those days he was Terry Parsons. He was not Matt Munro. You seek her kisses. All I remember is that people stopped dancing and listened. For which you die. Where his voice came from and his phrasing and the way that he sung, it's quite remarkable, really, and, you know, you can only say it, it's a, a gift from somewhere. Munro's voice was to continue winning over audiences, even after the teenager left London for a new life abroad in the British Army. Posted to Hong Kong with the Royal Engineers, he soon discovered a profitable sideline, singing in local talent shows. He used to have a talent contest in the Chiro Club, which is a services club. And the winners used to then do a half-hour program on Reedy Fusion, which was the local commercial radio. And I won this thing about five times, purely and simply because it was $10 Hong Kong and 200 Philip Morris cigarettes if you won. And I won it all five or six times, whatever, and they said, well, we can't allow you to enter the competition anymore because it looks as if it's crooked, which it probably was. I knew the comp here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I became a resident on the programme, like the guest artist, and then Really Fusion gave me my own programme, then Really Hong Kong gave me my own programme. Um, Teddy Parsons sings. I found even then he could sing all types of songs, all types of ballads. Obviously, he didn't have people writing them for him, like he did later on, so we'd listen to the records and he'd pick out songs that he liked, that like Perry Como or Frank Sinatra was doing. And what struck me again, he didn't always take the obvious one, he took one that he wanted to put his interpretation on it, you know. Can you imagine, I'd done everything in Hong Kong. I'd sung at the governor's party, I'd been on concerts, I'd done my own broadcast, I had my own radio programme, I was working the ballroom. I was earning a lot of money. I was got to be the highest paid squaddy in the British Army because I was still a squaddy. And when I came home, I thought, yeah, this is it, man, you know. I was going to take the country by storm. Monroe returned to a Britain in the grip of coronation fever, his buoyant optimism reflecting the new mood of the country. But his success abroad counted for little back home. Newly wed and with a baby to support, he took on driving jobs to earn money while continuing to sing with show bands by night. Well, when he was in the army, he was a tank driver. And of course, being discharged from the army, there's not much call for tank driving in England. So he decided that he would stay with the driving. Um, and he became a long distance lorry driver. And he was doing hauls up to Scotland and back but he was also um, singing with the Harry Leader Orchestra. And on the occasion that I went to Glasgow, he teamed up with two of the musicians and they went into a small studio and out of it came polka dots and moonbeams. A country dance was being held in a garden. I felt a bump and heard an old Beg your pardon. Suddenly I saw polka dots and moonbeams. When he did All polka dots and moonbeams, that first one, and then he heard it back, he hated it. He just didn't think he was going to sound like that. Now in a cottage built of lilacs and laughter. I know the meaning of the words ever after. 
This is what he wanted to do. He wanted to sing. He did uh, get a few jobs of that, but it, it was difficult to break in. He got married to Iris and had a son, Mitchell, but uh, it didn't really last very long, that marriage. The long days away from home took their toll on Monroe's first marriage, forcing him to abandon his life on the road. I couldn't afford to stay with the dance band anymore. I think I was getting 12 pounds a week then. And we were on the road for five nights a week and I had to pay my digs, it was ridiculous. So I went and got a job on the buses. While I was on the buses, evidently this record got passed around from various friends of mine who wanted to listen to it. Don't ask me how, I don't even know, but it got into the hands of Winnie for that one. Pianist Winifred Atwell was one of the biggest musical acts of the 1950s and Decca Records' most successful artist. Impressed by the young singer's demo, she set up an audition for him at her label. Decca not only signed the young unknown, but gave Parsons a new recording name. It wasn't his idea. It was actually Winifred Atwell's. And they used Matt from Matt White, who was an Australian journalist, who was the first person to ever write about him, and Monroe from Winnie's father, Monroe Atwell. And it was done in seconds. I think it had a nice ring to it. A name like Terry Parsons like, sounds like someone from Parsons Green, and that's frankly not very sexy, whereas Matt Monroe, where does that come from? It doesn't come from anywhere. It's actually a kind of mediated name, if you see what I mean. And therefore, it, it has its, its edges rounded off, just the same way, in, in effect, his accent had its edges rounded off. Valentina, my Valentina. As the summer, fresh as the rain, I want her only to hold her, to kiss her and kiss her again. If you look at the history of British sort of pop culture, which he fits into. Although he's not a pop singer, he's a popular singer, and that's what it comes from. That part of that was always the transformation. You lost your real name, and you became something else, and, and you lost your, your, your busman's outfit, and you put on a tux or, a, you know, a really well-made Savile Row suit. And that was the process that you went through. Your shoes got shinier as you went along the kind of, you know, the moving walkway of stardom. When you have Despite positive reviews and attempts to market Matt as the singing busman, Monroe's debut was overshadowed by the arrival of a vibrant new force on the music scene that was to change the face of popular culture. You, do you ever think of me? The New York Times critic John Perillis wrote that the history of the 20th century was the story of the triumph of rhythm over melody. And Matt Monroe was a melody man. I came as Matt Monroe in 1956, and that year, Elvis had Heartbreak Hotel, Tommy still had Rock with the Caveman. There were two other young fellas that never made it, called Cliff Richard and Andrew Faith. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I came in and uh, expecting everything to go whoom, you know, like that, and it didn't. For four years, nothing happened. Um, I was doing the show band. As soon as I joined it, seven months later, the show band became defunct. They disbanded. And I existed from then on doing sort of broadcasts once a week, getting eight pounds here and 12 pounds. Matt was very poor. He was very hungry, and he's trying to scratch a living. So he'd do, you know, he'd sing American basses. He'd do two or three shows a night. Uh, he'd do an advert. It didn't matter. He didn't have uh, the luxury of choosing what came along. But I was very fortunate, unlike so many people today, 
I had a wife that went to work, so I used to come home and while she went to work, I used to sit at home and look after the baby. We just got married and we just had a baby. <laughs> uh, we had no money apart from what I was bringing in, uh, which, you know, was quite good, but... Um, and the phone went, and he was asked if he'd like to do, come and do Pink Camé, the soap. What he didn't realise, what I didn't realise, is that not only did they pay us on the day, but it kept us in bread and butter for a long time. And from then on, he did so many jingles or adverts, whatever you like to call them, you know, he did Woolworths, he did toothpaste, uh, shampoo, cigarettes, milk, I mean, you name it, he did it. He was known as the king of the jingles. Monroe's early years were also plagued by comparisons with Frank Sinatra, at that time still the world's most successful male vocalist. Ironically, it was an offer to record a Sinatra parody that was to kickstart his ailing career and set him on the road to chart success. I was looking for somebody who had a voice like Frank Sinatra. And uh, there were two people who came to mind, Matt Monroe and Dennis Lutis, I remember it. And Matt had the better voice and sounded more like Frank Sinatra. And so I rang around to find out if he was available. And apparently he didn't have a recording contract and he could he could do pretty well what he wanted. I got a phone call from George Martin, who said, I'm trying to get hold of Matt. I would like him to do a track of this song as he thinks Sinatra would sing it, phrase it, because Peter Sellers wants to copy it and put it on his album. Well, Matt was absolutely flaming, because he wanted to record in his own name, not, not an impression of. Uh, anyway, I conned him into it, to be honest, and I said, well, you don't know what, what can come of this. CMI is a big company. I just needed him for a, one single job of singing one song, Disappear. No particular credit. In fact, I said, you know, we won't use your real name. This is supposed to be Peter Sellers. It was a Peter Sellers album, and the song was You Keep Me Swinging, and the album was Song for Swinging Sellers, which was a send-up of the Sinatra Songs for Swinging Lovers. Don't keep me swinging all the time To love you can't be a crime Don't keep me swinging all the time It's, it's delightful, delightful, delightful. Mm, I wish I could sing like that. When Peter Sellers heard the track, he said, I can't do that. Let's keep Matt on the album. And of course, the press were very interested. Who is this? We know it's not Peter, and it probably isn't Sinatra. On the record, I was known as Fred Flange, <laughs> <laughs> a capital singer. People were saying, who is Fred Flange? Who is Fred Flange? And my recording manager at the time, George, well, still is, George Martin, who records the Beatles. He came to me and said, well, I've got a nice little song we could do a sort of Nat King Cole on. I said, no more impressions, please. So I said, no, do it your own way, but it's that sort of treatment. And we went into the studio and we recorded this pretty little song, which I didn't have much hope for at all. It was a song called Portrait of My Love. This is one of those songs that, for me, quite seriously, no, no show would ever be complete without, because it was the first hit record I ever had. It wasn't a demonstration disc. <laughs> as it was described earlier this evening on television. It, it was a bona fide record which we made and issued to the public. It was called A Portrait of My Love. There could never be a portrait of my love for nobody could paint a dream. I'd been so impressed with Matt on that session that I thought about him quite a bit afterwards. But eventually I did get around to saying, would you like to record for me, you know, on Parlophone? And of course he jumped at the chance. He was not only an extremely amiable person, 
but he was also very, very good at what he did. For we professionals, it was great to go into a recording studio and work with someone who was totally knew exactly what they were doing. They put the music up, bang, and the thing was done, and it was all, instead of the tw take 25, and we're going to do it again, you know, Matt was always perfect, absolutely right. There could never be a portrait of my love. The way people phrase is the ultimate thing. You can get people with a great voice that can't phrase to save their life, and, it, and it's wasted, you know. But with Matt, it was right on the ball. I don't think you can really separate interpretation from his voice for this particular artist. I think sometimes when people sing, it is entirely their performance or their use of language that makes them exciting. But I think Matt Munro had the voice to match that as well. Anyone who sees her soon forgets the Mona Lisa. In a way, he's a, a middle-of-the-road man's Pavarotti. <laughs> he's got that ability to have the voice to express what he's thinking. I think when Matt started, it's probably a bit of insecurity <laughs> that, that gave him a certain politeness in the way he sang. It was very gentle, very light. But as the hits started coming, he became that finger-snapping, <laughs> Bobby Darren, confident type person. It's time now to meet Matt Munro. And the voice seemed to let fire, you know, just let go. And he became himself. In the early days, he sort of sang with the brakes on a bit. I get no kick from champagne. Mere alcohol doesn't thrill me at all. Tell me why should it be true? I get a kick out of you. Some they may go for cocaine. I'm sure that if he sang in a mid-Atlantic voice, clearly modelled on Frank Sinatra. Yet I get a kick out of you. He was one of those people who an older generation could appreciate because he came from the crooner tradition, as well as being a, a, attractive to people of his own generation and slightly younger. After years of setbacks, Munro had found his winning formula. His well-crafted romantic pop ballads took him into the top ten, making him one of the UK's most successful recording artists. The former bus driver was also to lead the cultural invasion of America that would define Sixties Britain. Pretty little face that face just knocks me off my feet Pretty little feet She's really sweet enough to eat She looks... Matt's breakthrough was to do with the time, the period of music at that particular time in the early 60s. This was the start of Beatles, Liverpool, Freddie and the Dreamers, Swinging Blue Jeans, you know, all that stuff. and. Matt came along with Portrait of My Love, Walk Away, From Russia With Love, classy ballads. From Russia with love, I fly to you. He clearly models himself on the idea of there being style which is why his choice for singing for the Bond movie in 1963 is really very interesting because the Bond movies, which were, although they're American produced, are British films and they represent a particular moment when Britain suddenly is sexy, suddenly has style. From Russia with love I've seen places Every success is the result of chemistry and the result of favorable circumstances. The circumstances of Matt Monroe's peak period was that popular ballads, beautifully produced, were popular worldwide. Of course, Frank Sinatra is the obvious example of that. Nat King Cole is another. But 
Matt had the good fortune to be produced by George Martin in his pre-Beatle days, and also to have met Don Black, who wrote for him a couple of unforgettable lyrics. And he also had uh, the benefit of Lionel Bart from Russia With Love, Leslie Brookes, My Kind of Girl. We're talking about an era of quality songwriting matched to a great voice. Like the Beatles, Monroe's voice became the international sound of 60s Britain. In the wake of Bond, he was to become Hollywood's king of the movie soundtrack, reaching a massive worldwide audience who might otherwise have never heard his music. In 1966, he recorded the theme tune to the film Born Free. It was to become one of his best known and most enduring hits, winning the Oscar for best original song. I've recorded so many songs with Matt Monroe that were good that it's very difficult to pick one above the others. But, um, I mean, he recorded one of my songs, which is still one of my favorites, There's a Place. But I think the true one that struck me as being the best of all was Born Free, because it was such an easy melodic song. John Barry wrote the music, Don Black wrote the lyrics, and uh, it became very big, and it was uh, identifiable with Med. Born Free, as free as the blows. As free as the grass grows, born free to follow your heart. I thought it was lovely. I thought it was very simple, very direct, it was not over stylized. I mean, I hate these people who come in and, 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 and they've got an idea for it. And they, they almost reinterpret the song. I, I liked his directness. I liked the fact that he sang the song the way it was written and just really added a wonderful sound and, and, and kept the simplicity there. When the walls divide you, you're free as a roaring tide, so there's no need to hide. In all these songs, he's got good songs for a start, that's the first thing, well-written songs. Gifts, actually, but I also found that the the orchestral arrangements of them were really, really interesting. That makes them different, so that that helps the singer. But what he begins to do in that is to sing a bit on the edge. Stay free when the walls divide you. When Matt goes up and hits the high notes and sustains them, there is a tremolo that comes into it, which he doesn't have in the lower register. And, and this is a fascinating quiver. It never goes out of key, but it introduces both vulnerability and suspense into the song. And he comes to use it often and effectively, because he only uses it a couple of times in each song, but it becomes a trademark of his. I beg you to stay. on the edge and that makes us as an audience excited my tears will fall now that you're gone I can't help but cry but I must go on I'm sad that I after searching so long the fact that he wasn't afraid to go high and he wasn't afraid to hold Walk on. 
people like Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Perry Como, all those people talked about Matt being the best singer that ever came out of this country. So they kind of endorsed him. When the word got around that Sinatra liked him, people took notice as well. The full glare of the American media was soon to fall on Monroe as the US record industry underwent dramatic changes. With the death of Nat King Cole and Sinatra's defection to set up his own company, Reprise, the giant American label Capitol Records lost their two best-selling male artists. The lad from Shoreditch was asked to step in and fill his boyhood idol's shoes. Matt died and there was nobody on the Capitol label at that time that could, was doing that sort of material. I don't say could, but was doing that sort of middle-of-the-road type material, as we call it. And I was asked to go to America to sort of take over, as it were, doing this sort of material. And uh, I went, and unlike British companies, American companies are very fond of paying what they call advances. And they paid me a very substantial advance which was hugely publicized in the paper press over here. Matt Monroe signs a million dollar contract. And I did, I signed a million dollar contract. This is the life. With recording of his new album moved to Los Angeles, Monroe was soon living the Hollywood high life. This is the life. Baby, you're there. This is the life. You've waited long enough, girl, you've arrived. Breathe in that air. When we first went to Los Angeles to record, we loved it. It made a great impression on us. And Matt had started to get bookings all over the state, so we decided slowly but surely we'll give it a try. We rather fancied that. So we took the children and a nanny and moved to Los Angeles. Loved it. This is the life for me. And living in America, what he did there was play golf, sat by the pool, rehearsed with Kenny. We used to drive the 26 miles into LA to work and do the records. Usually the records were done late at night. Most singers' voices are warmed up and ready by then, you know. <laughs> This is the life, this is the life. He loved recording, absolutely loved that. But I think if I had to say which was the bigger of the two for Matt, um, playing to an, a live audience, he loved the applause and he loved the laughter because he was really very funny in between singing. We have a few songs, some old ones, some new ones, some borrowed ones, some blue ones, and we sincerely hope that one of your particular favourites is amongst them. If you think it's not going to be and you'd like to let us know what your favourite song is, please forget it because we don't do requests. <laughs> but apart from that, I don't think the people in the front can hear. All the people at the back are laughing and all the people in the front are not. Matt was a great uh, performer of an audience. Uh, when he worked the floor, he really did work it. He would sing up in front of the band, first of all, and then he'd take the mic off the stand and he'd tell a few stories. And people loved him for that. He was not just a singer, he was an entertainer, someone who gave something of his life to them. And he would find a pretty girl in the audience, and they do, and sing to her. He just became part of the audience. They loved him for it. If I could be that magic kiss, you will sit at the front. Every show is the challenge, basically, of the audience. You have to go out. I mean, you, you can never get complacent. You can't just say, well, they've come to see me, you know. They'll accept anything. You've got to go out, and it's got to sound fresh. It's got to sound as if you mean it. I was going to use the word sincere, but that sounds a bit eek. You've got to sound as if you mean it, you know. You can't kid the audience. That magic kiss, your lips invite. We used to work quite a lot in Vegas, in, in America, and Tahoe, and places like that. 
and we used to watch the greatest comics. Henny Youngman, Alan King, Don Rickles, you know, a mass of people. We used to sit there and watch them go. And you'd learn from them and say, well, if I can put a little bit of that between my songs, you know, one, it saves the voice a bit, and, and two, it, it establishes a... Because there's nothing worse than doing a whole... a musical performance where the, the footlights remain as a barrier. You must get across there. He loved every single minute of it. I mean, I remember the first time we went to Vegas and we opened uh, the hotel suite. I think it was a Cary Grant suite, and we both jumped on the bed. We could not believe, you know. And he said, can you believe it, Don? My, my sister's on, uh, is a lollipop lady in Western Supermare, you know. Uh, you know, he just could not believe. You've got to remember, he, he stayed the boy from Shoreditch all the time. So every time he saw a twinkling light, or they said, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Monroe, you know, it, it was an adrenaline rush. Take my hand, I'm a stranger in paradise, all lost in a one. Absolutely loved the life. Unfortunately, and I still regret it in a way, Matt got very homesick. And he missed certain things, you know, friends. But I think later on, he wished he hadn't done it. He wished he hadn't moved back to England. Once again, the prodigal crooner returned to a changing Britain. The swinging 60s in its last halcyon days. A stranger, no. And to the surprise of many, it was not some revolutionary rock band, but Monroe, the middle-aged, middle-of-the-road ballad singer who recorded the song that became an anthem of the changing times. You find your songs because people submit. And this was in a pile of six or seven. I remember trying it out, because uh, we used to have sessions where we'd say, we've got this, what does it sound like? Run it through. And it was very odd, it was, isn't it? So, well, it was so quirky that Mickey and Matt and myself said, well, look, you've got the studio time. George Martin's in the studio. He says, you've got three hours. You try it. Shirley would go down to breakfast, shut the fridge and join the throng. Margaret Beatty snatched the milk and scanned the news and went along. We recorded it, had no idea of its value. Screwed her eyes up at her feet, saw the marchers, heard their voices making early... This thing about, that's going to be a hit. You know, it's like, it may work, it's more like it. So come with us, run with us. We're gonna change the world. If you listen to the lyrics of We're Gonna Change the World, as opposed to just listen to the voice, uh, they really are extraordinary because they are all about the revolution of the late 60s. Shirley Wood was dragged still sitting by a policeman from the road. Margaret Beatty had a face left by a man she tried to go. Annie Harris in the office paused in typing, thought of Don, bounced again at his last letter, died for others to live better, brushed away a tear and carried on. When he talks about putting life into people's wretched lives and so on, and going on marches and being done over by the police, all this seems to be in complete contradiction to the bouncy cheerfulness of the song itself. But this is the moment, it's 1917, it's actually the moment when, again, mass entertainment has caught up with youth and is turning youth into a commodity. It's like the way that I'd like to teach the world to sing is famous because it's a Coca-Cola advert. So what's, what's happening, I think, this is a kind of last gasp of the 60s when the whole thing is turned into a, a hit record and, frankly, politically meaningless except in, in the fact that its lyrics are completely ironical in the context of who's singing it. He sung about moons and dunes, um, which was the songwriting tradition that he'd come from. Changing the world was 
was the Beatles and was hippie stuff. And maybe he tried to, you know, cash in on that or catch up with that. Perhaps he saw that the world was turning away from his style of music. And I can imagine that happening. But at his best, he wants a rhyming couplet, a song with a bit of love in it, and some notes that he can hold. The world was changing for Monroe's style of music. In the post-permissive, post-Vietnam Britain, his innocent songs of love and loss felt increasingly out of tune with the times. In my heyday, young girls wrote to me. Everybody seemed to have time to devote to me. Everyone I saw all swore they knew me once upon a song. Main attraction, couldn't buy a seat. The celebrity. What does a guy who wears a suit and tie do when nobody wears a suit and tie anymore? You can look so out of date. Matt Monroe didn't change every album, he never changed. And his fans would remain loyal, but he wouldn't make new ones. If I never sing another song, it shouldn't bother me. I've had my share of fame. You know my name. The style had shifted to that of the group. And of course, by the time punk comes along, you don't even have to be able to play. In fact, that's the point. So that is the complete opposite of the craftsmanship which you expect from a crooner. He stayed much more true to the tradition of the crooner, almost of the pub singer, if you like. And it never left him. That's what he always was. He's always the guy in a pair of kind of patent shoes, uh, getting his songs from Tim Pan Alley and standing up on stage and crooning them out. While Britain's youth turned to the new sounds of the 70s, Monroe's popularity amongst the older mainstream audience never waned. He was also still much admired overseas, especially in countries steeped in the romantic ballad tradition. In the late 60s, Monroe began recording songs for the huge Spanish-speaking market, becoming a cult figure throughout the Latin world. Mas cuando quise hablar, alguien cantó. Do you speak Spanish? Not a word. Really? Oh, gracias, señor, you know. <laughs> and uh, una cerveza. <laughs> I think most holiday makers can speak more Spanish than I can. But it's principally for Latin America, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, no, Spain, we've had enormous hits in Spain. Mm. In fact, a lot of uh, British people come home and uh, ask me where they can buy Spanish records of mine. Matt had made some Spanish recordings and my first job for Yamari was in Spain and so I was standing at the airport as a nervous newcomer to my job waiting to meet this big famous artist and he was so popular in Spain wherever we went we were besieged by crowds and I had to sort of translate for him it was so exciting but we both learned together what this extraordinary phenomenon of Matt Monroe singing in Spanish Yo te di, mi amor. For un dia, y después, sin querer, te perdí. No creí que el amor existía, que también lloraría por ti. He was terrified of singing in Spanish. And clearly, he couldn't grasp the language, but he was paying respect to them. He was saying to them, I want to sing in your language, and this is my best shot. I don't think people in this country realise just how much Matt Munro achieved worldwide. 
I mean all over the world, from South America to South Africa, to Europe, to Australia, to New Zealand, to Hong Kong, to the Middle East, everywhere. Now you're nobody until somebody really loves you. You are nobody to that one somebody cares. He played the Araneta Stadium in Manila, in the Philippines, to 60,000 people. I think he outsold the Beatles there. And people stood up in the middle of songs, because they loved ballads there. So every time he did a key change or held a long note, they stood up. I mean, it was astonishing. Now this world is still the same. You can never change it. I think there were very few people who hadn't heard or knew a Matt Monroe song. And he was unique in that way, coming from this country and being a middle-of-the-road ballad singer. I think Britain takes their artists for granted. And they certainly took Matt for granted. Matt was Matt, and he was somebody who was all be, always be there. He was such a big success in so many countries all over the world. I mean, he was never without work, thank goodness. But happily, before he passed away, you know, he was shown by a British audience that they really loved him. Having lived and worked abroad for much of the 70s, in 1984, Monroe returned to the UK to play to a sell-out audience at London's Barbican Concert Hall. It was to be his final performance. For Daddy, the Barbican was a very special night because it was his hometown. And, um, I mean, no one could have predicted it was going to be the last show. But he sang better than ever, and he was so not well. He was actually in, in pain. could see that. And it was the first time ever that I remember him asking for someone off stage to bring him a glass of water. I'd never seen that before, but, I mean, he was in, in terrific pain. And he had a seven-minute standing ovation at the end. It just wouldn't stop. And a lot of people came to visit and see him that night, and it was a very special night. I think, for me, it will always stay in my mind because it was almost as if England had finally realised that he was a big star. He sang so well that even I thought, he's not got it or he'll get over it. Monroe had cancer of the liver, and in January of the following year underwent an organ transplant. But the cancer had spread, and the operation was abandoned. He never gave in to the disease, or even thought that that was the end. He stayed very positive, um, and even when the transplant wasn't successful, I don't think it, he really took him what that would mean. None of us knew or could predict how quickly it would be. I think I went most days to see him, and he'd say, oh, so-and-so has been in to see me, so-and-so has been in to see me. And I went in one day, he said, look at that, son, he said, and he, and he showed me a telegram, and it said, uh, uh, I believe you're not well. Um, get well soon, from one boy singer to another. Love, Francis Albert Sinatra. And he was so thrilled, I can't tell you how thrilled he was. Sinatra's telegram arrived just in time. Five days later, on the 7th of February, 1985, Monroe passed away in London's Cromwell Hospital. He was 54. Twenty years on, his music remains as popular as ever. And with renewed interest in the crooners of the 60s, Matt Monroe has been discovered by a new generation. Matt's style of singing, the same as Sinatra's and everything, will never die, but there will always be people rediscovering it. And I can assure you, I've given uh, the latest CD to people who said, why did that man 
stopped recording. And I said, for very good reason, the good Lord took him from us. Fashions go in and out of style, and right now, Matt Monroe is coming back. People have discovered him again. He ranks like the Beatles, who people still talk about, because he was unique and had a memorable quality. We left when my, me and my mum go down to the local shops, um, say HMV, we, I put all the, um, my granddad's um, CDs at the front so everybody can see them and buy them. I've just come back from Shanghai. Uh, I mention this only because along with Avril Lavigne records and Britney Spears and Madonna records, in the racks you've got Matt Monroe. This is in China. Of course, you very much so in New York and Los Angeles and, and Australia, but, you know, it's far flung. You know, he's, he's, his fame has really gone. And, of course, when, when I managed him, and we were always trying to get his records into America and into these places, that there's a certain irony. But I have a feeling Matt would be looking down and saying, well, what does it all mean, sir? There is a kind of, inevitably, a kind of generational nostalgia. His voice sums up that period of, I don't know, short hair, Italian silk suits, lambrettas, even the buses that he drove we now feel nostalgic for. As people grow up beyond their early teenage years and have an appreciation of the music of the 20th century, they pick up from people who were good. They should pick up on a few Matt Monroe songs. Even if it's only half a dozen, those half a dozen are great and uh, deserve to survive, and, and, and he will survive. I don't think he would have ever been anything else but a singer. The early rejections didn't faze him. He knew what he was going to do. He really knew. And I can't envision him doing anything else. It would be impossible to. He was always going to be a singer. Softly, long before you miss me, long before you are. For one more hour Oh, one more day After all these I can't bear the tears To fall so softly As I leave you there As I leave you there As I leave